So if you brought your Bible, please hold it high up in the air. Let's say this together. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe His word. And I live by His word. Christ is my master. And to Him, I am in absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. just want to thank the worship team. That was amazing worship. It's been a long time since I sang the song, To God Be the Glory. It was just so powerful just singing that hymn together. Just feel God's glory and God's presence uh, in this place. All right. Um, you know, we're having a little problem with our auditorium meeting place on Sunday mornings. Uh, we are not sure whether we will have this auditorium uh, for the month of August, September, uh, it's very unclear. Uh, the, the college authorities are not able to confirm that to us. But next Sunday, we will let you know exactly where we are going to meet in August. Right? So that those things are, those details are being worked out. We'll get to know. Uh, one request uh, is that. Um, one of, one of, the, of course, we send out email notifications when, as soon as we get to know where we're meeting. But another thing that we use is the SMS. Uh, um, only for, I mean, those who have prepaid SMS, by default, you're on DND. So you do not get bulk SMS messages. They don't come to you. They don't reach you. Um, uh, but those who have, sorry, those who have postpaid, by default, you're on DND. So those who are on prepaid, you can receive the bulk SMS messages that go from the church. So if, you, uh, if, you don't, if you're not receiving uh, SMS announcements from the church, and if you have a prepaid number, then kindly write your number on a piece of paper, your name and number on a piece of paper. And if you can hand it off to Pastor Steve or just give it to me, we will add, it, add your number to the list so that when we send out these notifications, today we are meeting at this place, you'll get it, and you can pass the word around and so on. Just... So we're kind of in that time, that period of transition. I don't know where we're going to go next, but we'll let you know next Sunday. And uh, wherever the cloud goes, <laughs> we'll follow. <laughs> so just to keep you informed, there's a little bit of uncertainty about uh, our meeting place, but we'll figure that out next Sunday, by next Sunday. All right, let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verse 1. We are going to... Uh, complete, uh, continue and complete what we started last Sunday, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. just want to quickly review and then move forward. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul writes here, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable or rational or logical service or worship. So we started off in this verse of scripture where we said that Paul is writing to us. He says, you know, I beseech you therefore. So there's a reason why he's speaking this in the light of the goodness and the severity of God in chapter 11 that he discussed. In the light of God's goodness, in the light of God's severity in, in dealing with people, I'm making this request that you present your body as a living sacrifice to God that is holy and pleasing to Him, which is your reasonable, logical, rational worship. So we said that when we present our bodies to God, it is our act of worship. When we sing songs, we worship. When we give, we worship. When we present our bodies holy and pleasing to God, it's also our act of worship to God. So he says, present your body as a living sacrifice. So 
this whole aspect of, of making my body holy and pleasing to God is not easy. It's a living sacrifice. There is pain involved. It's not going to be something that's ca casual walk through the park kind of thing. There is pain. But that's why it's a sacrifice. Offered up as a sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. And so we said that, you know, God is interested in our spirit, soul, and body. This verse is dealing with the body. Making our body holy and pleasing to God. And we dealt with two aspects. The aspect of conduct, being holy and pleasing to God in our conduct. Which means, in the words I speak, in what I do with my body, I must be holy and pleasing to God. Don't lie, don't steal, don't punch people in the face, things like that, you know, whatever. <laughs> holy in your conduct, in, in the way you behave in your body. Um, don't get involved in foolish jesting and, uh, and all those kinds of things. Paul tells us, we looked at Ephesians 4, 17 to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. Then we said the second area where we have to be holy and pleasing to God in our body is in the area of our sexuality. And we spent some time dealing with that. How all of us struggle in this area uh, just because your spiritual doesn't mean your bodily passions disappear. It doesn't. Uh, you are spiritual, but you're, you're still in a body. Your body still has its desires. The sexual appetites are still there. And it's important that we learn how to master and manage our sexuality. We looked at First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. I'm just reviewing uh, where Paul says, you know, um, that I, I want you to know how each one of you should know how each one of you should possess your vessel, your body, in sanctification, meaning in holiness and in honor. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual impurity or immorality. So he says, you must possess your body. You must know how to master and manage your body in purity, in holiness. And so then in talking about that, we dealt with three areas. We dealt with the attractions to the opposite sex, uh, the whole area of lust, how do you control it? We dealt with the area of pornography or indirect gratification of sexual appetites, which again is not right, is displeasing to God. We dealt with the area of masturbation, how this is, and I shared with you my stand on it from the Word of God, from 1 Corinthians six twelve. And I know there are different opinions, but from what I shared with you, Paul writes, he says, all things may be lawful, but all things are not helpful. All things may be lawful, but not all things are profitable. So the real question is, is something helpful and does it, does it control you? And therefore I said, my stand is, I do not practice it simply because it is not helpful. And number two, I do not want my body to be controlled by anything. Amen? That's where we stop. And we said, we will come back next Sunday to talk about how do we master and manage our body in the area of conduct and in the area of sexuality so that we can present our bodies holy and pleasing to God. So I suppose everybody has come prepared for surgery. <laughs> Amen? Now before you get into the operating theater, there's a preparation. <laughs> so, so this morning is very simple. I just want to share with us spiritual realities that all of us can tap into, all of us can walk in, in order to master and manage our bodies so that we can present it holy and pleasing to God, which is our act of worship. Amen? To be a worshiper of God, you worship God in your body as well. Not only in song, not only in giving. These are very valid forms of worship. But also in your body. As you offer your body holy and pleasing to God, you are worshiping God. Amen? So, we want to spend some time on that. And I'm just going to share with you seven spiritual realities and how I apply them in my life. Now, you as a believer, God will give you things that are very personal to you. God will give you additional things and that's fine. I'm just sharing things that I find useful in my life, just passing that on to you. Seven spiritual realities that I find useful in being able to master and manage my body in my conduct and in my, uh, uh, in my sexuality so that I can present my body holy and pleasing to God, which is my act of worship to God. 
Now here's what I believe. I believe that spiritual truth must translate to practical experience. Amen? If spiritual truth is this nice thing, you know, that we say, wow, that's nice. That just tickled my mind a lot. And wow, you know, how did he figure that out and all that. But if it doesn't translate to touching my everyday life, then it is just nice theory. That's of no practical value. But what we see is that all these truths that you and I have actually been hearing about, and we've, some of us have heard this many times, that all of this truth really God intends for it to touch our everyday life so that in everyday life, these truths transform us. Amen? And that's what we're going to do. That these seven things I'm sharing with you are not new for all of us. Many of us would have heard it. But I just want to share with you, this is the truth. Here's how I apply it. Maybe you will learn to apply it a little differently. But this, these truths will affect our everyday life, will empower us, to master and manage our bodies so that we could be holy and pleasing to God in our conduct and in the area of our sexuality and on worship God in our bodies. The first truth I want to talk about, spiritual reality I want to talk about, is the power of the cross. Everybody say it, power of the cross. You know, I, I know our brain, 80% of our brain learns through visuals. So I apologize, I've not been preparing the PowerPoints. Right? So 80% of it is lost already. Just think, don't get the time to do it, but um, try to visualize with me. <laughs> the power of the cross. The reality. The power of the cross. Now, this is how God works. The God of the Bible. The way God works is He completes something in the spiritual realm and then He says, walk it out in the natural. That is how God works. Jesus died on the cross not 2,000 years ago. Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the that was completed before the world began. It was completed in the spiritual realm. Then in time, he died on Calvary. Here's how God works. He makes you a new creation. And then he says, put on the new man. Religion works the other way. Religion says you turn a new leaf, be a new man, then you might become some new ascended glorified creation. God doesn't work like that. He first makes you a glorified new creation and then he says, live it out. He first declares you righteous and then says, live righteous because you are. He first declares you sanctified. You're totally holy. Stink a little bit, but you are sanctified. And then he says, now live a sanctified life. He first declares you a winner. Christ triumphed on the cross for you. You have won. Now he says, now live a victorious life. He first declares you healed by whose stripes you were healed. Now he says, walk in divine healing. So how does God work? He completes the work in the realm of the spirit. It's a spiritual reality. It is done. You are not working to it. You're working from it. You're not working for it. You're working out of it. It's a big difference. Religion says, you live a good life, you will attain eternal life. The God of the Bible says, I give you eternal life, now live a good life. Amen? That's how God works. And that's the cross of Jesus. On the cross, 
It is all completed. Now God says the work is done. You live it out. Amen. Now as a young man. After I came to know the Lord. Maybe I was about 14, 15 those days. At that time. I was on this quest of how do I live a holy life? God, how do I get rid of all the sin in my life? How do I live a clean life? And I used to read these books about Charles Finney and John Wesley and some of the great men of God. And almost all of them said they went up into the mountains. And they had this total amazing experience in the woods. And they, came, and they called it the baptism experience, whatever. And they came out totally changed people. Serious, you read their stories. So I was looking for my wood experience. God, I've won that experience. Somehow strike me with a bolt of lightning. Somehow do something in me so that I can get rid of all this sin and, and come out like Charles Finney, others, you know, and just be that amazing person. I thought that's how it's supposed to happen. And uh, then I would read some books and some books were saying, no, 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 you have a sinful nature. You'll always be like that. I was like, I'll always be like this. I have a sinful nature in me. Oh, man. So I was struggling. God, how do I live a holy life? I mean, what's the secret? How did these men of God live holy lives? And what's it? And I remember those days in school. On Saturdays, I would go to the Methodist church. See, it's good to go to the Methodist church. If you haven't, you need to. <laughs> I used to go to the Methodist church and uh, Richmond, Richmond Town Methodist church. And then we had this Stevens Hall. They used to, and there used to be a library attached to that. And interestingly, somebody, I don't know who did this, on purpose left a lot of charismatic, spirit-filled books in the Methodist library. So it was in the Methodist library that I first read books by T.L. Osborne, F.F. F. Bosworth, Charles and Francis Hunter. I mean, all these spiritual, tongue-talking, devil-chasing, healing the sick evangelists, their books were in the Methodist library. And the Methodists didn't know about it. So here I was. I actually went to spend my Saturdays in prayer. I would lock myself, morning till evening on Saturdays, just spend time praying, reading the word. And I started reading all these books. And then, I, so I here was on this quest, God, what to do? What to do? How do I clean my life? And then I finally came to Romans chapter 6. So Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8. When I first read it, I couldn't figure head or tail of it. Because it was in King James. It was so difficult to understand what Paul was saying. And so I remember those days, I was 15 year old, I'd have my King James Bible, I'd have Good News Bible, I'd have NIV, I'd have whatever translations I could find all around me. I'd read it in King James, I'd read it in NIV, I'll read it in Good News, I'll read it in Amplified, trying to figure out what is he saying. Romans 6, 7, 8. That's how I'm trying to learn. Nowadays you got Eastward. So easy these days, but that was those good old days. But then as I read Romans 6, 7, 8, over and over and over again, back, read it again, read it again, read it again, slowly I understood. God has already completed the work of setting us free from sin. It's done. It's done. I am not trying to work my way into freedom. I am living, I'm supposed to live out of the fact that I am already free. Amen. Romans chapter 6 verse 6, Paul says, Knowing this, everybody say knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Now, you know, honestly, I didn't know what he meant, old man. So I had to look up Good News Bible, Living Bible, uh, Amplified Bible. What is this old man? Then it'll say, your old sinful nature. Huh? Old sinful nature. 
Knowing this, that your old sinful nature was crucified. So those theologians were lying. Because if something is crucified, how is it alive today? The Bible says your old sinful nature was? See, you do not have a sinful nature. It was crucified on the cross. What you have, Ephesians 4.23, what you have is a new man. What about this new man? Is after God, is created in the image of God, in righteousness and true holiness. That's what you have. So I realized, whoa, I don't have a sinful nature. It was crucified on the cross. Knowing this, that old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin. Again, I didn't understand body of sin. What's he talking about body of sin? So again, read all the other versions. Body of sin. Body. Understand. The body of sin simply means the power of sin. That the power of sin should be broken. So that we no longer should be slaves of sin. Work on the cross has completed it. The old man your sinful nature was crucified the power of sin over your life was broken you are totally free from sin you are not a slave to sin that's why later on the same chapter verse 14 he says for sin will not have dominion over you for you are not under law but under grace sin will not have dominion Oh, you no bad habit, no sinful behavior pattern. I don't care what the root causes, it cannot have dominion over you. It was dealt on the cross. The work was completed on the cross. God is saying, Live out of it. You're not striving to it or for it, it's been done on the cross. The power of sin over your life has been broken. But there are three things, Paul says, in the light of this three things we must do. Three key words he uses in Romans 6. He says, knowing. Everybody say knowing. He repeats this word knowing many times. Many people don't know about it. They don't know. So they are trying to become free when God says, I have set you free. They are trying to crucify something that God has already crucified. Your old man's dead. Burial is over. You have now a new man. And sometimes by mistake, instead of trying to crucify the old man, they start crucifying the? Kya kar rahe ho ya? <laughs> and they think I'm putting to death. No. God dealt with the old man. The old man is dead. Let the new man live, please. So knowing... The second word he says in Romans 6, so Romans 6, 6, knowing. Second important word he uses in Romans 6 is reckon. Romans 6, 11. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God. Second word, reckon. The word reckon is an accounting word, which means to count as a fact. It has the idea of counting money. Reckon. So let's say you're counting, you're tallying something. You add, 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 it comes to 200 rupees. You add a second time, tuck, 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 200 rupees. Add a third time, tuck, 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 200 rupees. You start in the middle, you work up, work down, add it, 200. Start at the bottom, work up, 200. Reckon. Meaning, this is a fact. However you want to look at it, it is a fact. Reckon. Count it as a fact. You are dead to sin. Finished. It's a fact. I am dead to sin. Now this is where many people miss it. Many people know because they heard so many sermons. But they don't take the next step of counting themselves. I am dead to sin. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. Count yourself. I am dead. To sin. I have nothing to do with sin. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin. Number three. The third word he uses often in Romans 6 is the word yield. 
Therefore, yield ye your members as instruments unto righteousness. Yield. Know the truth. Your Jesus, Jesus dealt with your old sinful nature. Second, reckon this to be true. This is true in my life. What the, whatever God did is true. It's reality. It is more real than the natural. You say, but pastor, you don't know I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with Listen. The reality is you have been sanctified. The reality is the power of sin over your life has been broken. This struggle is just a temporary thing. You can come out of it. That's not the reality. The reality is on the cross. The power of sin over your life was broken. So, but pastor, I've been in this bondage for 25 years. That's still not reality. Yes, it is in the natural but there's a greater reality that is on the cross. This thing you've been struggling for 25 years was only fooling you. On the cross, this thing actually was broken off your life. That's the spiritual reality. And Paul says, I want you to reckon that as a fact. That this thing, even if it was fooling you for 25 years and held you in bondage, was actually broken off you. You actually have the license to be free from it. Reckon it as a fact. And the third step is to yield. Yield yourself. So that brings me to the second spiritual reality. I call it the power of consecration. The power of consecration. Consecration is a powerful thing. God has already sanctified you. It is a completed work. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, such were some of you, and he gives a list of things that we all were. And, and then he says, but now you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. In the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our God. He says, you have been sanctified. So it doesn't matter how bad a life you lived, in Christ, you are sanctified. Sanctified means made holy, a holy vessel. Pure, set apart for God. So sanctification is a work already completed through the cross. To live it out, we call it sanctification is a process, but that really is consecration. My response to God for the sanctification is already completed. Amen? That's consecration. So first, the power of the cross. It's a spiritual reality. I'm going to walk in it. I am free from every sin, every bondage, every addiction. So if you're sitting here this morning and saying, you know, I've been bound by this habit, this behavior pattern. I lose my temper before the hat touches the ground. Some people, at the drop of the hat for me, before the hat drops. Doesn't matter what problem you have what character flaw you have in your conduct or in your area of sexuality doesn't matter. The truth is Jesus Christ set you free. He said it is finished. It was established before the foundation of the world in the, nat in the spiritual. On the cross he said it is finished. It is done in the natural. It's done. Completed. So you are free. Reckon it as a fact. Then brings us to the second point, which is the power of consecration, where now I yield my members unto God. Sanctification, God has already made you a holy person. So you're out of that, you're living. You are not trying to be holy in order to reach that place. You are holy because God has already made you holy. He's already sanctified you. In Christ. Christ is your sanctification. 1 Corinthians 1.30. And I can give many more examples. Hebrews 9.14. He has sanctified you once for all. Set you apart. I mean, there are many scriptures on this. He's already sanctified you. Now you're living out of that. That's why you live holy. Because you are sanctified. You live a sanctified life. So that is consecration. Me offering to God. Saying, God, help me. This body is consecrated to God. I, I consecrate my body to God. So now, in consecration, my will is involved. That's why he says, yield your members. My will is involved. 
The work is done. Now I have to use my will. God will not override human will. Can you imagine? God was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God is watching this whole thing happen. I mean, and Eve was going to pluck the fruit of the tree. I mean, could, couldn't God have just made the tree a little higher? She's trying to reach. Just a little higher. Trying to reach. God, what's going on? What happened? No, I'm just protecting humankind, you know. I mean, God could have done all these crazy things. I mean, he could have taken the fruit, about to budge, it's gone. He could have saved the entire human humanity. But God never did any of those things. He watched Adam and Eve sin. He didn't jump in and intervene. Why? He respects our will. And this is where God gets the glory. When as an act of our own will, we consecrate our bodies back to the Lord. That's why it's an act of worship. As an act of your own will. Amen? This is something all of us are invited to do. As an act of your own will, you consecrate. Someone said, but no power in my will. <laughs> no willpower. Low on battery. <laughs> totally drains. Now listen. Your will is your emotional muscle. Everybody say emotional muscle. Just as your body has muscles sticking on it even though you don't know about it. <laughs> And your muscles can be exercised to be made stronger. If you exercise your muscles, they become stronger. That's why you go to the gym. The same thing is true about your will. If you exercise your will, you can make your willpower stronger. It's your muscle, it's emotional muscle. You exercise it with the word of God. You exercise it with prayer. You exercise it uh, uh, through your declaration that you make. Each time you exercise your will, you exercise it by pra constant practice. Each time you exercise your emotional, your will, you're building up emotional willpower, your strength, emotional strength. Amen? So nobody can say, I have no willpower. Build your muscle. So consecration is powerful. How do I practice it? I declare, I pray, I just pray, Lord, I consecrate my body, my mind, my emotions, my sexual appetites, my sexual desires. I consecrate these things to God. It's my response to God. The fact that He has sanctified me, I'm responding. I'm saying all these things are sanctified to you. Sometimes I just say it. I say, my mind, my body. My emotions, my sexual appetites, my sexual desires, these are consecrated to God. This is holy ground. So, your pastor, your sexual appetites are holy ground? Yes. Why? Because it's consecrated to God. Amen. So, you declare it. You are consecrating your desires, your bodily desires unto God. Some other areas... Of how I consecrate practical things. Peter says, you know, in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant. Because your enemy, the adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion looking for him, him whom he may devour. Meaning, you know, you saw, you, uh, yeah, those of us who watch National Geographic or Animal Planet, you see how they, they show these uh, lions hunting? No, they, they kind of hide behind and their skin coat just blends in with all the dry thing. And then they pounce. That's how the devil is. Right? He's setting up traps. When you least expect, he comes. So Peter says, be sober, be. Always on guard. Don't assume because everything is brown, the devil is not there. No, maybe he's there. Hiding in the bush somewhere. So be sober, be vigilant. So you always be on guard. So here are some practical things I do. Number one is I stay away. See, it's very simple. This is no, you know, no big thing. If you don't take the first bite, you won't want more. Very simple. So stay away. 
Stay away from going down those websites that, are, that have all kinds of trash on it. Just, just don't do it. Stay away. So, but my willpower. Yeah, build your willpower. Build your muscle. Or, while you're building your muscle, don't turn your computer on. Don't have a computer. So what am I doing? Why aren't you using your computer? I'm building my willpower first. <laughs> then I will power it on. <laughs> Make sense? Build your willpower. If you think you don't have the willpower to say no to it, first build your willpower, then, you turn your, then use your machine. Go down there. Second, I have self-defense strategies. So you need to have self-defense strategies. That's why if you come to our present office, there are no closed doors. It's an open space. I did it on purpose. We are setting up a new office for APC in Kalyanagar, and that office is all glass. So now we have doors, but it's all glass. Did it on purpose. Why? Because I don't want to put anyone, myself or any one of us, in a situation where you find yourself counseling a woman behind a closed door. Never happens. It's all glass. So these are self-different strategies. Well, it's common sense. So now you know why it's all glass. <laughs> it's the motivation behind it. Amen? I mean, these are things like that. I remember when I was first time when I went to the U.S. This is really funny. I went to this church. This was in Cleveland, Ohio, Church of the King. One of my first times visiting there, I went there. And, this, and uh, you know, when you go after service, people come to meet you. And so here was this, this lady who was talking to me. She was one of the worship leader's wife. She was talking to me. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not used to having somebody stand so close to me and talk. So she was coming close and I was moving back. She was coming close, I was moving back. She was coming close, and I was like, I'm trying to keep some distance. I can hear her. I don't need to stand so close. You know? So I was just trying to keep some distance so I can, we can have a conversation. And uh, you know, I'm fresh off the boat, just come from India to the United States. <laughs> For me, this is normal. Keep a distance with a lady when you talk. So I, a couple of, sometime later, I was... I, had a, I was talking to her husband. We were in the car together. And he said, hey, my wife told me something very interesting. She said, every time she was speaking to you, she had to take a step forward and you were taking a step back. She would take a step forward and you said, what, what's, what's happening? That's when I realized it was such a big deal for them. <laughs> for me, all I was doing was keeping a little distance. Ma'am, I can hear you. Just stay there. I'll stay here. We'll talk, you know. And for me, that was my part of my self-defense mechanism. You stand there, I'll stand here, we can talk, you know. And so things like that, whatever you need to do. I normally don't hug women. Not because I don't like to. It's just that I, there are selected people that I hug. Right? Family members. Now, I've been to Pentecostal churches. You cannot wear gold there. You have to wear white, but they hug. So I'm like, what, what kind of the standard this is? You know? The pastor will give holy kiss to all the ladies. But no wearing gold, no wearing, you only have to wear white. What's more dangerous? Tell me. Okay, anyway, that's a different subject. Huh? So these are self-different strategies. Things that you need to do as an act of your consecration to protect yourself. Simple things. Number three is amputation. What is another power of consecration? It involves amputation. If you find yourself that you've, you ended up in something that's wrong, and all of us end up like that, and sometimes, you know, we, we end up suddenly, bef before we realize it, we find ourselves something trapped in something. And let me tell you, in the area of your body, The one way that you need, one way that you will have to take to come out is called amputation. That's why Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it off. Pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it out. That's it. It's the power of consecration. 
Another fourth thing is this. I try to be extra cautious in my moments of vulnerability. All of us have moments when we are very strong, but we also have moments when we are very weak. And you need to know what those moments are. Commonly speaking, in moments of great crisis or great success, you are most vulnerable. Because when you have great success, you're celebrating, you tend to let all your guards down. Or in times of great crisis, great pain, great hurt, great emotional turmoil, you're very vulnerable. Because you, your mind is all gone. Uh, you can't think straight. What was right and what's wrong is all blurred. It's a very nice time for the devil to make the lie, prete- uh, make the lie appear as a truth. And the things you would say no to, you now say yes to. Why? Because you're going through that emotional turmoil and you can't think straight and you're very vulnerable. And that is true for all of us. So you have to be very careful in your moments of great success or great weakness. You need to know your vulnerable moments. All of us have it. If you'll read King David, he was a man after God's own heart. But in 2 Samuel chapter 11, he was in a moment of great success. I mean, this was the height of his rulership, kingship. He had conquered his enemies, everything good. And it came, 2 Samuel chapter 11 says, that summer, he said, I will just chill. Seriously. I mean, it's not in the Bible. But it's somewhere. <laughs> he said, you know, it's summertime. The kings, it's springtime. The kings go to battle. I'll send my people. I want to relax. I mean, I've done it all. Achieved success, whatever. And it was in that moment of his great celebration, great success, when he fell to Bathsheba. So either moment of great success or moment of great crisis, these are very vulnerable moments of your, of our, for all of us. That's not the time to go tell your problems to some you know, office colleague of the opposite sex. That's not the time to do that. You'll get yourself into serious trouble. Amen? So in your moments of vulnerability, you have to be doubly careful. Don't expose yourself. Increase your power of consecration. Here's something I've been learning, and it's not the main part of the message. I'm, 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 I'm just working on, another, on a book on a code of honor and just talking about practical things for people in ministry. One of the things I'm learning here as I'm just working on this is the greater visibility God gives you, you choose to pull yourself into greater obscurity. The greater height God takes you, you choose to take steps down to greater humility. Because I was thinking, you know, how can a man preserve himself when God takes him out of, into greater visibility, when God takes him to greater heights? What self Defense mechanism can I put in place when God is doing this? And this is what I learned. When God's lifting you up, you choose to step down lower. When God is taking you, making you more visible, you choose to put yourself more into place of, uh, you know, hide yourself more. So these are self-defense mechanisms you develop as as, as a way of your power of consecration. Well, it's only 12.30. Amen? Number three. We're only on number three. I need to go quickly. Um, you're supposed to do a video also. Um, all right. Let me just go forward. Number three. The third spiritual reality is the power of the word of God. I'll finish this quick. The word of God. Psalm 17 and verse 4 it says, By the words of your mouth 
I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. So through the word of God, you keep yourself from the paths of destruction or the destroyer. Psalm 119 verse 9, very familiar verse. How can a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed to your word. So God's word helps us walk in purity, stay away from the paths of the destroyer. So you need to be well nourished and well nurtured in the word of God and use the word of God as your weapon. The word of God is like fire. It will burn up the chaff. It's like hammer. It will break the hard places of your own stubbornness. It's like water. It will clean up your mind, your thoughts, your thinking. So fill your mind with the word. Here's what I do. Here's how I use the words. Like I shared last Sunday, when a lustful thought comes, you say, Pastor, you get lustful thoughts? Yeah. So why? Because the same devil that attacks you attacks me also. Serious. Right? It's not like I have holy devils and you're bad. <laughs> so, when a lustful thought comes, what do I do? I take the word. The word says, lust not after her beauty in your heart. So I say, God, thank you. She's a good looking girl. But Lord, I will not lust after her, after her beauty in my heart. Pastor, do you have it recorded anywhere? No. <laughs> but I know that's what I do. Fight it. Fight those thoughts with the word of God. Amen. Anything else? So whatever wrong thing comes, you counteract it at the thought level. Like I said last Sunday, as a thought level with the word of God. Do not let the thought progress. If the thought progresses into a reasoning, it becomes an argument in your mind. It becomes an imagination. It becomes an imagination. You begin to picture it. Then it becomes a reasoning. It begins to, you know, you begin to say, okay, yeah, it's okay. It's not that bad, et cetera, et cetera. So it all started with a thought. The thought became an imagination. The imagination now becomes a reasoning. And if you're not careful, it becomes a stronghold. It weakens your will, takes you captive. So you've got to stop it at the thought level. You cannot prevent the thoughts from coming, but you can prevent the thoughts from staying. Just because a thought came is not sin. Do you know that bad thoughts came to the mind of Jesus? Oh, I never read that. It's in the Bible. One thought went through him. See, I've been fasting so long. I can just make the stones bread, no? Nobody's in the wilderness. Nobody see me. The thought came. Why don't you make the stones bread? The thought came. If you worship Satan, all this power will be given to you. We need a new team called security. You know? <laughs> Sorry. I just, uh... <laughs> okay, so the thought came. Jump from the temple of the pinnacle and the angels will save you and everybody will applaud you. So these thoughts, wrong thoughts, tempting thoughts actually came to the mind of Jesus. But he had not sinned. Why? Because he rejected those thoughts. So use the word of God to stop evil thoughts. Second, I use the word of God to renew my mind. Renew my mind. So what happens? If I'm struggling with something, I'll go and read those scriptures. On purpose, those specific scriptures that deal with that particular area, I will meditate in it. You know why? Because throughout the day, you're exposing your mind to all kinds of things. And all kinds of reasonings are being formed in your mind. So you need to go and undo that with the word of God. And say, this is the truth. I will stay in it. So reason, uh, you, you reprogram. You retrain your mind. Renew your mind with the word of God. On purpose. Got to do it. So you're taking spiritual reality and using it in your life. So that you can offer your body as a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God. That fourth area is the power of the Holy Spirit. Power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come to do many things in our lives. He's, he anoints us. He empowers us. He brings the gifts. And he, 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 does, he, he does many, many things in us as believers. But here's one most neglected area of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers our self-discipline. We're going to have a self-discipline anointing service. I'm just joking. See, nobody will come for that, you know? Prophetic, yes. This, that. Self-discipline, no. But the Holy Spirit empowers our self-discipline. 
Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, self-governing ability. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Sound mind, the Greek there means self-control or discipline. The, the spirit God has given us is a spirit of self-control, discipline. The Holy Spirit increases your capacity for self-control. So you pray, ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me. Very simple prayer. Holy Spirit, help me. Let's practice it. Let's say together, Holy Spirit, help me. Very simple. So in your moments of weakness... Pray a short prayer. I mean, you can pray long if you want to say. But I'm just saying, a simple prayer. Holy Spirit, help me. He's there to help you. Amen? Now, in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, after Paul tells us that God has dealt with the power of sin, in Romans 7, Paul describes his life as an unsaved man. How he struggled with it. He knew the truth, but he didn't have the power to do it. He wanted to do what's right. He didn't have the power to do the right. In Romans 7, he talks about his struggle. And then he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He says, who's going to help me? The answer is in Romans 6. How do I live it out? Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation through our for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So here's the answer. How do I live out what God has accomplished for me on the cross is through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps me to mortify the deeds of my body. Romans 8 verse 13. Paul says. If you, by the Spirit, mortify the deeds of your body, put to death the sinful deeds of your body, you will live. So the Holy Spirit helps to put to death the sinful deeds of your body. So ask Him, Holy Spirit, here's something I need you to help me mortify in my body. He will help you do it. Amen? But ask Him. In Romans 8, 26, He says, Our Spirit Himself helps us in our weaknesses. Romans 8, 26. So you have a weakness. What weakness is Paul talking about? He uses the same word weakness in Romans 6. He says, But because of the weakness of your flesh, He's spoken of it in Romans 6. Now in Romans 8 and verse 26, he says, The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. So he's there to help you in your weakness. So we can't excuse ourselves and say, Ah, this is just my weakness. I always get angry. This is just my weakness. I always tell lies. This is just my weakness. I always criticize. This is just my weakness. I always whatever. No. The Holy Spirit helps us in our So ask him, help me, Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5, he brings this out once again. I'm just running through this very quickly. Galatians 5, verse 16, the Bible says, Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, meaning walk. To live out the, in, the, in the New Testament, when you use the word walk, it means to regulate your entire life. That's what it means, walk. Regulate your entire life. How? By the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Regulate your entire life. Walk in the Spirit. Regulate your entire life under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And if you do that, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Dead. So here's a spiritual reality we can walk in. How do I apply it in my life? Another aspect of the Holy Spirit, He's the Spirit of fire. Holy Spirit is the Spirit of fire. Fire. Fire burns up the chaff. So I say, Holy Spirit, come. I want more of the fire of your Spirit. 
Burn up these ungodly desires. Burn up the chaff in me. It's a great thing to pray Sunday morning when you're in worship. The presence of God. Come Holy Spirit. You're the fire of God. Burn up the chaff. Help me Holy Spirit. Do it. It will empower you to walk clean. Just bear with me as I finish here. Otherwise you'll have to hear it next Sunday. So. Number five. The power of prayer. The power of prayer is another spiritual reality. There are two dimensions of prayer in this context. Number one is this. Prayer aligns your will to the Father's will. You know, sometimes you get so wrapped up in a wrong thing that nobody can help you. Humanly speaking, you're hopeless. Have you met people like that? Maybe you yourself are in a state like that sometimes. Right? It's like totally so wrapped up in something. It, you know it's wrong, but you're just caught up in it. I got to. Emotionally, you're bound. You're st- or sometimes you're just struggling with something. Now, there was a point in the life of Jesus when he struggled. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 to 9, bring this out. And it's very interesting. It says Jesus had to learn obedience. Jesus had to learn obedience. Meaning he had to come bring himself to a place of obedience. What? Yeah. Read it, Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. How did he do it? Through much travail. Cries and tears and prayers. He brought himself to a place of obedience. What's Hebrews 5, 7 to 9 referring to? You and I know it. He's referring to Matthew 26, the Garden of Gethsemane. What was Jesus doing in the Garden of Gethsemane? He was praying. He told his disciples, could you not tarry with me one hour? Let us watch and pray. Watch and? Some of you watch and go. (laughs) Watch and pray. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. What was Jesus doing? Praying. So here's the important part of prayer. There are moments in our lives when we are so much in turmoil, so much confused. That our will is not aligned to the will of the Father. What must we do? Go pray. Stay in prayer like Jesus did. Until you come out with your will aligned to the Father's will. That's what Jesus did. He learned obedience. He learned to bring his will in line with the Father's will. He said, not my will, thy will be done. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But Lord, it's okay. Your will be done. The Bible says it was his learning obedience. So in that time of prayer, you go in with your will all messed up, all confused. You come out with your will aligned to the Father's will. It's the power of prayer that you have to use in your life. Various points. If you're struggling, you have to do that. Another very important aspect is praying in tongues. That's why we we, we have Holy Spirit baptism services often. We want everybody to be praying in tongues. Why? If you don't pray in tongues, you're missing out on something very vital in your life. In Romans 8, 26, 27, the Bible says, The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. How does He help us? Continue in that verse. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. So how does the Holy Spirit help us in our weakness? In our, through our prayer. It's very interesting to study 8, Romans 8.26, the Greek. It says when, when it uses the word help, it means the Holy Spirit takes a hold of together with us against our weakness. What is your weakness? They say, I can't get rid of smoking. I can't get rid of, you know, whatever, something. We all have some little issues here. I can't get rid of it. Listen, the Holy Spirit will take a hold of together with you against your weakness. One of the ways He does it is when you pray in the Spirit. 
He strengthens your will and pushes against that weakness that you're fighting. So the power of prayer. Last two things. The power of declaration. You've heard it many times. We need to make a declaration. I say with my mouth. I declare with my mouth. My mind is consecrated. My body is consecrated. My desires are consecrated. Your declaration is powerful. You overcome the adversary by the words of your mouth. Your words of your mouth as a little tongue is like a ship. The rudder in a ship, James 3 says, it can control the whole ship. So your words are powerful. Even when you, when you don't feel like it, you say it anyway. Because then your body is being brought into subjection to the truth. So I use the power of declaration. I declare, my mind is holy ground. I refuse unclean thoughts. I say it. Your declaration is very important. The last spiritual reality is the power of influence. The power of influence. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 33, Paul says, Don't be foolish. Evil company corrupts bad habits. It's very simple but very powerful. Whom do you hang out with? You say, I hang out with all Christians. That's nice. What kind of Christians? Are these Christians who lift you up or are these Christians living a life of compromise? Because listen, if you're hanging out with Christians who are in living in compromise, you will also compromise. So, but they're Christians, yeah, but they're compromising Christians. For them, a little sin is okay. So what will happen? For you also, a little sin will be okay. So it's not enough to hang out with Christians. Question is, what kind of Christians? Are these people who will lift you up or will they leave you down? I challenge you, as role models, don't pick that nice guy, nice girl around you. Pick somebody who's way up ahead of you. Then they will challenge you to rise up to higher levels. Amen? If you pick a turkey, you'll be like a turkey. Pick an eagle, please. Serious. You can hang out with turkey Christians or you can hang out with eagle Christians. The choice is what you want to be. They're both Christians, but they're different. So the power of influence is very important. Because when you hang out with people who are compromising, what they say will be all compromise. And what happens? The words you hear affect you. If they are speaking and having compromise in discussions, you too will hear those words and you too, for you compromise will become normal. So you've got to hang out with Christians who refuse compromise, for whom black is black and white is white and they don't meet. Amen? There are a lot of Christians who, have, who live in the gray. Sunday morning they become a little dark. Oh, sorry, little white. Monday, little dark. Listen. You make a choice. Who are the people you're going to hang out with? Who are the people of influence in your life? Because that will affect everything you think, the way you perceive, the way you live. I challenge you, have role models who are far above you, who will make you so uncomfortable, you don't want to get near them, but yet you make them your role models because you want to be like them. And you will pass the stage of being uncomfortable and you begin to love them. Because they were willing to go and nobody else was willing to go. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. Thanks for bearing with me these extra few minutes. I want us to pray. We're just going to close. We plan to show you a video and all of that, but it's just a way off our time. I want to pray right now. And this is very important. Please, please, this moment is very important. While we have talked about these seven aspects of spiritual reality, how to take spiritual reality and make it practical in our lives and live holy, consecrated lives, 
There is also this dimension of the anointing of God. The anointing of God breaks the yoke. For some of us, we have, may have got so entangled with sin, it has actually become a yoke on our lives. So what, what mean yoke? What does yoke mean? It's a little thing that, thing that you put on a bullock. The bullock has no power to shake it off. It's on it. Trapped. And that's why the Bible says it's the anointing of God that breaks the yoke and removes burdens. There are many of you here who can testify in a moment things you had in your life for a long time just went away in a moment. I've heard some of your stories. What was it? It was the anointing that broke the yoke. Just in a moment, disappeared. Why? The Holy Spirit did it. For some of us, the reason we are what we are is because there are deep-seated roots. And I'm not going into that, but it could be you were abused as a child. And so your whole sexual orientation is all messed up. It could be you got introduced into drugs as a young man and you're bound with it now for a long time. And whatever. There are root causes for certain behavior patterns that we find ourselves bound in. But the good news is this. Jesus came to lay the axe to the root. He didn't, cut to trim, he didn't come to trim a few leaves. He came to lay the axe to the root of it. So we are going to pray. A very simple prayer now. And I'm believing God. We all, just let's all believe God that in this place... If there are people here who say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just bound. I'm helpless. I am taken captive, literally, by this habit, by this addiction. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's some substance that you're addicted to. Maybe it's some behavior pattern in your conduct or whatever it is. And maybe the root cause of it is, could be whatever. Doesn't matter. But in a moment, as we pray from, in a few moments from now, as we pray... We are believing God that the yoke will be broken off your life and the axe will be laid to the root of the problem. Jesus will deal with it. And He can lay an axe in your life, in my life, at the root. Where no counselor, where no psychologist, no psychiatrist, no, nobody else can reach. He can put the axe right there. The anointing of God God can break off the yoke. In a moment, it's gone. The fire of God can burn up the chaff, the filth in our lives and it's gone. It's gone. Brothers and sisters, it's only take, I'm going to take a moment. If there's such a thing in your life, I want you to pray. Just be honest with God this morning. It's not between you and me. It's between you and God. Would you pray and say, God, I've been tolerant to this thing in my life. Whatever it is, you name it. This behavior, this pattern of behavior, this sinful lifestyle, this addictive behavior. Well, I've been tolerant to it. But God, I want to offer my body as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to you as my act of worship. Come help me. Come help me, Holy Spirit. Come help me. I want to do it. Your will is involved. You must be willing first. He will strengthen your will. If you're willing, just pray. Say, Lord, I'm willing, God. Come help me. Come help me. Father, this very moment, as we, your people, stand before you, we thank you for having completed the work of setting each one of us free. We thank you the work is done. Now we want to walk in the freedom, the liberty with which Christ has set us free. We don't want to be slaves anymore. We're not called to be slaves. We are free people in Jesus. No sin will dominate us. No sinful behavior pattern will control us. We are free. So in the name of Jesus, 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, I command yokes to be broken, burdens to be removed, addictive behaviors to come out in Jesus' name. Every unclean spirit that has held God's people captive, come out in Jesus' name. Lord, set every person free in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come like the fire of God. Burn up the chaff. Burn up the child. We thank you God. It is done. It is done. It is done. Every yoke is broken. Every burden is removed. The chaff is burned. We thank you. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Arise and shine for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Though darkness cover the earth and deep darkness the people. Yet the Lord shall arise upon you and his glory will be seen. Upon you. In Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being patient here this afternoon. Go and live those lives that are holy and pleasing unto God. Amen.